Cliff has already won. Uh, so I could actually begin with a little bit of an anecdote here. Anecdote, anecdote, anecdote. Same thing, I think, a Freudian slip in this case. Um, it, at the last conference that Cliff and I were at, we, we do this periodically, even if it's not if it's informal, as some of you observed this morning. Um, at the last conference I was at, uh, we were at uh, in Kalamazoo, um, Cliff and I ended up, we were on the same session, and we ended up, people asked us about the longbow, and we contended against each other, uh, as you will see. <coughs> Later on that evening, I was at a restaurant in, uh, in Kalamazoo, and uh, uh, the, someone brought me out a, a shot of bush milk, uh, whiskey, and said, uh, uh, I, I said, well, I didn't order this. And they said, no, no, someone in the bar bought it for you. And they told me, it's because you were sensible. Now, no one accuses me of being sensible and lives. Uh, so I had to go inquire. Of course, I drank it first. But I had to go inquire as to who might be my uh, benefactor here. I went in and it was two people at the bar that I had not uh, ever met before. And I went up and I said, I introduced myself and everything. And so, oh, no, we know who you are. We just think you were sensible. And I said, well, at what point was I sensible? And they said, well, in discussing the longbow, you were sensible. And at that point, I got bought another um, round. So I, uh, precedent has been set. When I am finished, I anticipate that several of you will see my arguments as sensible, and that uh, whiskey will be the preferred um, means of thank you. I also remember when I was younger uh, and um, in high school and debating quite a bit, uh, seeing a, an Oxford Union debate between the great economist John Hel mm -hmm. Kenneth Galbraith and Milton Friedman, at which point uh, the int introductions were all ad hominem. Uh, Oxford individuals, um, especially in the debate union, uh, think of themselves as rather witty and think of ad hominem arguments as really rather witty. And uh, well, maybe I could get into this, but I would lose that debate. Um, Cliff is better looking, fitter, a harder worker, an awfully good friend. And also I would say he's better at imitating the 19th century English attitude of Longbow than anyone. I met out of the dominance and invincibility of the battlefield. Actually, the myth of longbow invincibility, longbow uh, domination, longbow determination, whatever we want to call it, goes back even further than the 19th century. And I would contend that it goes back to the period it was being used in. And one of the reasons that we have so many quotes written by so many individuals who never were alive at the Battle of Cressy is because the myth had already taken on by that time. That it didn't continue is evidenced by the fact that the English lost the Hundred Years' War, something I continue to remind them about as we go along. Now, I will, uh, I will give some concessions here. Cliff has already indicated one, which is that I, he has convinced me very much uh, against earlier things that I wrote in agreeing with Strickland and uh, Matthew Strickland on the, on the length of the bows, I do think that there are long and short bows. I think he makes a very convincing argument there, and I hope that, uh, that this will be listened to um, by scholars and enthusiasts who want to recognize the differences in weapon systems and the different uses there. So this also convinced me that there were probably a larger number of casualties caused by longbow on the battlefield, um, initially, in some of my earlier writings, some 20 years ago, I had indicated that I didn't think there were a large number. Uh, this was following uh, uh, Claude Gaillet and John Keegan and some others. And I do think he's right. I think that there were probably more. But I also contend that the that as he is using primarily chronicler accounts, and chroniclers by and large exaggerate numbers and exaggerate um, the ruthlessness of a battle and the blood of a battle and so forth, that, um, the exact, that there is an exaggeration in responding to many, as many are killed, and things like this. We would never trust, for example, uh, Adam Murimus, uh, uh figures on the Battle of Cressy. He has extraordinarily uh, large numbers, extraordinarily 
um, uh, impossible numbers. And uh, yet we want to conclude with him written, what, 1380, that uh, somehow 50 years before a battle was fought and um, that there were many killed, and that's okay, but the numbers the uh, has are not. Uh, there are more contemporary sources that are used to suggest the uh, use of longbow at Ashtori. He brought some to the fore. But again, chroniclers are writing stories. And as stories go, they are not counting what they have never seen. And no one, uh, other, no one, I think, among those chroniclers who seen that battle. But certainly none of them counted the defeated numbers and how many of them were defeated by longbow shot. So contemporary sources continue to be a problem. And so too do, um, does art. Where's the, the public side? Yeah, I'll look at the <laughs> red the thing again. Um, no? We, we need Kelly's slides up? Yeah, we need my slides up. As depicted. Here's where Ashenkor was fine. <laughs> <laughs> See the hills. Cloud for the day. It was. Yes? Yeah. There we go. Okay. Uh, this is a, de a depiction in heart of the Battle of Ashenkor. And as you can see, um, both sides were using longbow and they stood 10 feet apart. Um, clearly, art has some um, some uses of that can be made, especially in identifying the bow. I think Cliff is using it very well in identifying the bow length, for example. But clearly, having the French firing long bows as well as the English, and having them stand so close, and having them miss actually so many arrows sitting in the middle, uh, is is a problem. So too is this uh, depiction, uh, the same uh, chronicle, or I'm sorry, that was the last one of the most relay manuscript, late 15th century, late 15th century Poissart chronicle. And you can see that the archers were actually standing at about five feet from the people they were firing at. Uh, the Battle of Cressy, crossbowmen, um, <coughs> awfully close to the knights, and awfully close to longbowmen. Uh, La Rochelle depicting the English, uh, um, the large English Navy with a long bow uh, down in the far, your far right corner uh, would suggest maybe that the English should get bigger ships. Battle of is a little bit better. Uh, the long bows here are depicted uh, being used along the sides in the, in the uh, crow's nests. And finally, of course, this uh, battle scene where we see all the English long bows depicted. Oh, that's right, the army. So art can be a problem, and relying on chronicle sources and the exaggeration of chronicle sources, relying on art and the fact that they have to depict uh, art uh, to highlight certain things that are obviously they've never seen. We're talking about artists and chroniclers who've never been there. I prefer to take a more general and more broad look at what we do know for a certainty coming from the tactics that are used over and over and over and defy the sense of the longbow as an invincible weapon or as a uh, determinant weapon or anything along those lines. Much more along the sensible line, to use that term again, of um, a tactical weapon that was used with archers similar to the way that men at arms were used as a tactical weapon elsewhere in the line. I think you'll see what I, what I mean in just a moment. First, I should say I gave a, a talk once in England called The Failure of the English Longbow. And I really did worry about my life as uh, the English have a mythology of longbow that would suggest killing an American who was saying it didn't work with a longbow would be justice. And they would be let off 